as viewers, you may not have realized this necessarily, but as far as critiquing media goes on YouTube, a big part of it is gone. And when I say a big part of it is gone, I mean the whole critiquing part. People are still analyzing media, whether it's anime, cartoons, movies, songs, whatever. But something that used to exist that pretty much cannot be found anywhere anymore is any YouTuber that's actually already popular actually roast anything. Even Mother's Basement, for example, a guy who made his career off roasting Sword Art Online does not roast anything aside from Sword Art Online. He's still going back to that same dead horse to continue beating it, but he doesn't actually critique anything else or anything new or anything at all aside from saying oh this is much better than sword art online now i use him as a very brief example but if you really look around there used to be people that actually critiqued things but being that that entire mindset is met with such negativity from the fans of that given thing people just don't do it especially when it's something popular no one takes any pot shot at it because oh it's too dangerous this is so sad you see so much more analysis of the good than critique of the bad and low-key that's fine i do a lot more analysis of the good than critique of the bad because i'm much more passionate about talking about what i like than what i don't like so today i realized wait a second i'm a relatively large anime channel and i am passionate about the given topic not passionate for my hatred of deku the main character of my hero academia which is what this video is going to be about but i'm passionate for annoying people <laughs> with my takes and it just makes me so happy. I started saying some shiz against Deku on Twitter and people just started harassing me and it was so much fun watching them get worked up about it. I know, I'm a horrible person for this but at the same time, if you're really getting bent out of shape because I don't like your boy Deku, you kind of deserve it. <laughs> so, that is where my ever-flowing passion for this video is coming from. And because of that, I would like to ask you a favor. If you have a friend that really adores My Hero Academia or adores Deku, the protagonist oh he's such a good boy must be protected forever please please share this video to the masses <laughs> <laughs> because I'm about to spit facts and I'm gonna have a ton of fun doing it. Sorry fam, but Deku's a bitch. Now, full disclosure before I actually get started, I kinda liked Deku until after the tournament arc of My Hero Academia and since then I think he's been pretty garbage. So keep that in mind because if you do find that Deku was in fact amazing and wholesome and wonderful until that point, well then I'm kind of agreeing with you. It's only after that point that I think he's become a relatively bad protagonist. And my knowledge of this series goes through the villain arc of the My Hero Academia manga. So I'm past where the anime is by quite a bit, but I did not read the most recent arc of the My Hero Academia manga because I like waiting for the arc to finish and then I read the whole arc in one go. With that in mind though, I will not be spoiling the manga until I tell you I'm about to be spoiling the manga because Deku only gets worse over time. Also, I will be comparing Deku to other shonen protagonists throughout and I know you people are already going to be complaining you can't compare him to other shonen protagonists it's a totally different piece of media because i already get that complaint whenever i do comparisons but comparisons are a valid way of bringing out points in themselves so i will do that this is my hit piece on deku this is why deku sucks this is why deku post tournament arc is my least favorite shonen protagonist from a popular manga series happy april fool's day oh my god what crazy timing for this video. Normally, I make a video memeing on something and laughing at garbage when I'm not really serious, but today I'm fooling you because today I'm actually serious and today I'm destroying Deku from My Hero Academia. Got him! Oh boy, the comments are gonna be amazing to read. I am so looking forward to it. Hell yeah. Please leave me your comments of fortitude or and distress on why I'm either an amazing person or terrible person. Smash like on this video if you agree. And if you don't agree, but you appreciate hearing other takes, also smash like on this video. If you're too closed-minded to hear another opinion, well then, that dislike bar, it's all yours. We're gonna have to start from the beginning because Deku, right off the bat, rubbed me the wrong way even though I just said I liked him until post-tournament arc. Shh! 
everything will become clear. When I first read the description of My Hero Academia, I was expecting Deku to be a more Batman-like character. I mean, there's a world where everyone has quirks, and Deku's the only one that doesn't have a quirk. Kinda sucks to be him, but he still wants to be a hero, so with intelligence and big brain alone, this man may be using gadgets or something, will still become a hero. That's kind of where I thought the series was going before I actually started it. So when I started it and it turned out Nah Fam, he just inherited Superman's powers, I was slightly disappointed, but I was still intrigued nonetheless. This doesn't necessarily deduct points from the story, it was just slightly disappointing that that was the direction the story was going to go based on the description of the anime itself. This is obviously not necessarily disappointing on Deku's part, but I will not lie, a lot of my interest going into this show was seeing how this wholesome boy, where the universe was against him and didn't give him a power, how he was still going to become the number one hero. But now that he's already inherited the strongest hero's quirk, well, all he has to really do is learn to control that quirk. All the mystique and mystery of how he's going to approach that pedestal is actually kind of gone. When it comes to other series like Naruto or One Piece or even Black Clover, where the main character also wants to become the Hokage, the Pirate King, the Wizard King, that mystery is still there the entire time. How is someone whose ability is to literally stretch his arms longer gonna take on the world government and the strongest emperors of the sea? He's starting his adventure with nothing. He has a ragtag team of like 10 pirates on his side and he's out here taking on armies of thousands. How is he going to do it? And you have the same question when it comes to Naruto, just showing you how massive the actual Naruto world is. During the tuning exams, there are scenes like Neji versus Hinata, where Neji was getting out of hand and he was gonna hurt Hinata, and in an instant, the moment he went too far, three Jonin incapacitated both fighters. Or when Gara was attacking Lee after their fight was over, Guy from the stands appeared between them, brushing off Gara's attack like it was nothing. This is that Gara that everyone was terrified of, and Guy brushed off his attack to save his students. The massive distance between a Joni ninja, which is not even the top tier of the verse, and the Genin we are following right now was massive. How will our protagonist get there? Or even someone like Asta with no power who managed to gain anti-magic, which is broken in its own way, it doesn't necessarily convey the feeling of, oh, this is gonna be stronger than the current Wizard King who can like, you know, freeze people in time and that's only the beginning of his magical powers. Deku, given one for all, right off the bat, eliminated the mystery of how he was going to reach that spot. We immediately know that all he needs to do is master his powers and he will literally become a carbon copy of All Might. Now, this isn't necessarily a problem when it comes to the story. Every story is coming from a different angle and this narrative device just needs to be used properly because it's told again and again that the theme of the greatest hero isn't the strongest hero, it's the hero that will smile in the face of adversity and a hero with a pure heart. And that's all lovely, but as far as Deku goes as a protagonist, the interest is not on par with that of Naruto, Luffy, or Asta to the extent of how they will reach that point. And now, as kind of an addendum to this little point that I'm making right now, it's very important to mention that the power system of My Hero Academia, while great when it comes to one of the largest themes in the series, and that is people being mistreated in the society based on how they're born, which is I think what My Hero Academia excels at, and it's one of the things that makes My Hero Academia phenomenal as far as the series goes, it does not do justice to the trope of how far can the main character go. I love the fact that most of the villains in My Hero Academia are deformed in some way. Their quirks deformed them and therefore society hated them and therefore they ended up taking the villain path. As a simple example of that, Gang Orca, the number 10 pro hero, was selected to play the villain role when it came to the license exam arc of My Hero Academia, which by the way was one of the worst arcs in the series, but they got Gang Orca because he was the hero that most looked like a villain. Why should his appearance convey the fact that he's a villain? Well, that's because there are big social problems in My Hero Academia, and that's what makes the series so fascinating. But if you look at Deku, if this guy is given the strongest quirk, he'll become the strongest hero. That's almost expected. If you look at a world like Naruto, you got Lee or Guy, people who don't use any ninjutsu whatsoever, but they could still, through their hard work and dedication, make it to the top tier of the verse. That just goes to show that while natural talent is obviously super important, hard work can close the gap greatly. In My Hero Academia, unfortunately, that is not the case. If you took a guy without a quirk and he trained his ass off every single day and every single night, 15-year-old Todoroki would annihilate him in an instant. And because of this, 
it immediately gives us a different perception of Deku before the series even really begins. Now, I'm gonna be talking more about Deku's character, not just the circumstances underlying how he becomes who he becomes. He's immediately introduced as the character with the purest heart, and that's basically a given as far as shonen protagonists go on a generic level. I mean, so I have no complaint as far as that goes. The generic shonen trope of the good, kind-hearted, wholesome dude evolves to become super badass. I mean, look, I think Luffy's one of the greatest shonen protagonists of all time, and he does that justice really well. And on the flip side, Gon is also one of the greatest shonen protagonists of all time, but he's a borderline sociopath. Taking the kind-hearted route is great, and Deku just wanting to see people smile is amazing, and in fact, I'm working on a whole video praising My Hero Academia because of the whole theme of smiling. So definitely subscribe, but back to Deku, he's a bitch! Why did he get that one-for-all quirk? Oh, it was because Slime Monster was attacking Bakugo, who, by the way, was bullying him his entire life, but Deku doesn't care. Deku ran to the Slime Monster to attack him, and Deku had absolutely no chance of winning, okay? Deku was about to die just like Bakugo, but All Might managed to gather his energy, save the day, hip hip hurrah, Deku was in fact useless after all. Oh no, the only reason why All Might came to save Bakugo was because of Deku. Oh, come on. That's basically saying All Might is a psycho and he would have had no problem watching Bakugo die even though he could have technically done something to save it. And then All Might, who had the really important task of selecting someone from the next generation to give one for all to, he was on his way to give it to Mirio, who low key, I know there was an entire arc showing about why Deku is actually worthy, but that's horse shisa. Mirio would have been far superior with one for all. Imagine one for all and his permeation ability. Oh my God. But no, because young Midoriya sacrificed himself where he was definitely going to die. That means he was actually perfect to receive one for all. Terrible thought process on All Might's part, but even worse is how the story is trying to paint this in Deku's praise, okay? And this is a theme that you see again and again with Deku trying to show how he is so wholesome, so selfless, he'll do these actions for others. But now let me give you a lesson in the art of selflessness for a second. There are two key components. Component one, in order to be selfless, what you're doing is to actually have a chance of succeeding. Damn it. Running at Sly Monster is more suicidal than it is selfless. Even if the chances are slim, at least that can have a selfless nature. But a 0% chance? What, his whole massive plan was to throw a backpack at him? Let me tell you a selfless action from another shonen protagonist. And I just mentioned this one because we do a One Piece podcast every week where we're covering every arc of One Piece in order with Anime Uproar, who is reading them as we go. Link in the description to the Rant Cafe channel where we're doing the One Piece Virgin podcast. We just covered the Drum Island arc. And in the Drum Island arc, there is a certain scene that honestly, I didn't remember all that well until rereading it. But Nami got sick and Sanji was knocked out. And Luffy, this dude, sees a sheer cliff that he has to climb up. A 500 meter sheer climb in a blizzard with avalanches coming down in the blistering cold. And he's climbing it with his bare hands. He has Nami on his back and he's carrying Sanji with his teeth. And he is climbing up this mountain for hours. 500 meters, by the way, is like five times taller than the biggest structure on planet Earth. It's a sheer climb. The weather was brutal. And there were many times as he's climbing up that he slips for a second and he slides down so many feet with his fingers erupting in blood as he tries to grab onto this cliff. And he just has the resolve to keep going. And when he finally gets to the top where the doctor is supposed to be, yes, it's the stupidest place for the doctor to be, but not the point. And the doctor's running to heal him because this man looks more dead than alive. He says, don't you dare heal me, heal my crewmate first. That is selflessness. That had a chance of succeeding. He did succeed and it was wonderful. So that is what I like to call a selfless act. The second type of selflessness is something that doesn't directly put others in harm's way. And Deku fails that as well. Not in the case with the slime monster, but one of the biggest, most wonderful selfless things that Deku did was trying to save Bakugo from the League of Villains. In the third season, Bakugo was captured, big sad. All the heroes were trying to work on a way to save them. They directly told Deku, please don't do anything. You're a student and you kind of suck. And Deku was like, okay. Then Deku goes to his class and is like, fam, let's do this. So while I understand that it was selfless in a way, it was also stupid in another way. And if it's not for the fact that all the pro heroes showed up at that given point, Deku and his entire group of friends that came with him would have died right then and there. 
Oh, but it all worked out because the heroes did come and Deku ended up actually saving the day. Plot convenience and being an intellectually honest character are two completely different things. And while I respect it from a narrative standpoint, Deku's still a bitch. And he's a terrible example of a selfless protagonist. If you were to ask me the high point in Deku's career, it's when he fought Todoroki during the tournament arc. He's trying his hardest to become a hero. His dream, his life is contingent on becoming this hero. So in this tournament arc, where there's no massive ramifications when it comes to beating your opponent, and he's fighting Todoroki, he lets Todoroki win. Well, not really, but he doesn't go full force until Todoroki starts using his fire powers, which inadvertently saves Todoroki from the massive depression shell that he was locked in. Deku versus Todoroki is one of the high points of My Hero Academia for me, and it's the real reason why I say Deku only becomes absolute garbage after the tournament arc of My Hero Academia. What is Deku's narrative? Deku's narrative is this guy who's pushing forward, and he's so selfless, and he wants to see other people smile, he's willing to accept the self-sacrifice and burden of saving everyone, carrying everyone on his back with a smile. So that's why I really like this fight. In this fight, in order for Deku to reach that level of hero he wants to become, he has to really try to win. But by winning and beating Todoroki only using his ice powers, the ideal of actually saving every person is something he has to sacrifice. In order to be the hero, i.e. save Todoroki from the shadow that's enrapturing his heart right now, he has to forego becoming a hero, i.e. he has to lose this match. So the reason why I appreciate this fight so much is because this is that number one thematically relevant goal he has to overcome. This is him acting as a hero by sacrificing becoming a hero. That's why this scene is so perfect. That's why I love Deku versus Todoroki. But that's honestly where Deku's character development ended. That is where we draw a line and we see no more growth on Deku's part past that. There was no moral dilemma on what he should do, where he actually made the right call. The guy kept training, and that's all lovely, and a lot of people on Twitter have been attacking me, being like, yeah, but you're forgetting about Deku versus Muscular when he risks his life. Bro, he broke his arm. Oh, this is so sad. Oh my god. Ichigo took on the entire Soul Society to save Rukia, and then took on the entire army of Aizen to save Orihime. Deku needs to break his arm to punch in order to become a hero, which also gives him tons of wealth and fame and, and all that stuff, which is obviously not why he's doing it, but side point, Ichigo doesn't get any clout for doing what he's doing, which just inherently makes the act so much more selfless. Unless saving them is the clout. Unless Ichigo was a simp all along. More on that later. And as far as Deku being a pretty dope fighter, one thing that always bothered me is the power scaling in the world. Now, I am not one that has been known to appreciate power scaling to such a high degree. For me, honestly, the fights in Fairy Tale, while the power scaling makes no sense most of the time, I still find them enjoyable because there is a lot of heart behind them. When it comes to Deku, though, every single fight, the power scaling is garbage. If this man can flick and take down glaciers due to the air pressure of his finger hitting the air in front of him alone, him punching anyone should turn them into a pile of splatter. But still, this man managed to beat the crap out of Stain. He punched Stain like three times and Stain kept getting up. That's not normal power scaling. It's just come to a point that with every single aspect of Deku's character, I cannot take this wide-eyed, idealistic kid seriously. His heart's in the right place, but his head's not, and yet the series is still bending over backwards, going through hoops, making things work out for him in the end. If you want to compare Mirio versus Overhaul to Deku versus Overhaul, the obvious first thought is, well, Deku versus Overhaul was way better. First of all, it was longer. Second of all, the animation was better. Third of all, the climax of the fight was just amazing. And if you think that way, you kind of missed the point of Mirio's entire character. Mirio Mirio's existence is a slap in the face of what Deku should really be in My Hero Academia. Just for a moment, try and compare the two before I explain the difference between their fights with Overhaul. Deku and Mirio both wanted to be the number one hero. They both had the same dream and the same aspiration, and here was the difference. Deku had no quirk and therefore had no feasible way of actually getting to that point, while Mirio had a quirk that at the point of his control over his quirk, he was useless. He trained morning and night he made something out of his quirk that was truly unbelievable. He was also told that he would be a failure. Through his years of training, it was only at a certain point when he fully managed to control his quirk that he became something amazing. He created Lamillion with his own two hands. It wasn't some power-up God given to him by anime Superman. Just comparing the two, they're in an entirely different league just from the outset alone. Deku needed the power of luck that he bumped into 
to All Might that day to have magically gotten the strongest quirk ever, and Mirio needed to do that whole back-breaking labor aspect of it. Now, I'm not saying that Deku didn't work really hard after he got it. Obviously, he did, but that's really not the point. The message that it's trying to convey is kind of sad. The reason why Lee versus Gara is one of my favorite fights in all of anime is because Lee lost at the end of that fight. It's because it was hard work versus natural talent, and Team Hard Work actually lost. It's a slap in the face that, yeah, reality sucks sometimes, and you gotta make the most of the reality that you have. That's such an important lesson, and it's so not what Deku is trying to teach us by his character. Deku's coming into the story with such naive idealism, it's painful to watch. He's hitting you with that famous speech of, even though you're born with nothing, through hard work and the power of wholesomeness alone, you will reach the greatest of heights. And you know what My Hero Academia tells you? Nope, that's not true. You just need to be lucky enough to bump into anorexic Superman and him to be in a giving enough mood to give you his powers because you made a terrible decision to attack a new age hentai monster, which would have absolutely killed you. Great answer, My Hero Academia. Great protagonist that you're trying to slap us with. If you compare it to Asta for a moment, because Asta's also someone who had no powers until he magically got this really badass sword that nullifies magic. In a way, you could say that this complaint that I'm having about Deku is the same against Asta. So why am I making this whole hit piece on Deku and not Asta from Black Clover? I mean, honestly, making fun of Asta would get me way less hate than making fun of Deku. Shouldn't I go down that route? Well, bold of you to assume that the hate is not what I'm looking for. That's first. And secondly, no. Most of Asta's fights aren't actually won purely because of his anti-magic. Obviously, it helps. Obviously, the shonen ideal of accomplishing the impossible is actually great. But Asta, according to the author, is the second strongest character in the entire Black Clover series on a physical level. Not including magic, this guy would body mages just because he's a physical tank. That's one. Two, he was hoping that when he turned 15 and got his grimoire, it would unlock magical powers. And when it didn't, this man kept training his body. He wanted to actually help people and he wanted to do better. He wanted to become a wizard king without having magic. An ideal that's ridiculous. But while it would have been impossible for him to do without obtaining this anti-magic, at least the mad lad did something productive on his own, unlike Deku. But going back to overhaul for a moment, because this arc contrasting Deku to Mirio was really the nail in the coffin to Deku's character, and it's really honestly where Deku only started getting worse from that point. But before getting into the entire meat and potatoes of that overhaul fight, if you notice, it ended up with Deku winning against overhaul in essentially a one versus one. Yes, he got that ultimate Eri bonus Mario mushroom power up, but it was in effect a one-on-one -on -one fight. Focusing on how Asta wins his battles, almost every key fight in Black Clover is where a group of good guys have to work together seamlessly in order to defeat a far more powerful adversary. And that's a theme from the very beginning of the series. Even when Asta obtains this crazy anti-magic, he never actually one-shots these massive opponents. When he was up against Veto, who was already slightly tired by wiping out most of the Black Bull's guild, they only won with this crazy strategy where Asta would attack full force without needing to worry about any repercussions or if he would get hit, because that is all on the shoulders of his two support fighters. Vanessa, the string mage, who would constantly yoink him out of tough positions and yeet him into portals made by Finral, where he would constantly and consistently open them to save Asta and to put him in a position where he could attack. Asta's focus was solely on the offensive, where the entire defensive was on the shoulders of these mad lads. That fight is one of my favorite fights in the show, and it pretty much outclasses every single battle in the entirety of My Hero Academia on a technical level. When it comes to the technicality of fights, My Hero Academia is very very lacking. The heart is definitely there. I think Deku versus Todoroki, once again, made me swoon. Deku versus Bakugo, both of the first and second time were emotional hype beasts, and even something like All for One versus All Might was emotionally riveting. But when it comes to the technicality of the fights, they all wind down to who has the bigger punch. And being that Deku has a power like he 
does that gets him in the position of pretty much always winding down to a 1v1, he'll win with his bigger punch. It's not necessarily because of the heart and inspiration he gives to other heroes to get them excited, like Asta does to get the Black Bulls invested in a battle. It's not that heart that really gets his fights further as much as it is his skill. So being that Deku's fights are won from this quirk that was given to him by All Might, it feels so much less potent than someone like Asta, who wins his fights because of the inspiration he gives his friends to ally with him in this war. I keep diverting my attention from this Deku versus Overhaul fight because really, in essence, the major point I wanted to bring out was the difference between Deku versus Overhaul and Mirio versus Overhaul. While the animation was mind-blowing in Deku versus Overhaul and the heart was there and Eri needs to be protected for all of eternity because she has a smile that must be protected more than the spoilers that Bakugo dies in the manga. Wow, can't believe I let that slip out. Oops, wow, I guess you all know now. Oh, shame that there's no way to cut this piece of the audio out. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Oh, this is so sad. F's in the chat. So while the fight Deku versus Overhaul was amazing, and I am stressing it was amazing, it's not because of Deku's character. This video is not to slap My Hero Academia around at all. I love My Hero Academia. It's to slap around that bitch-ass Deku. Now, if you look at Mirio versus Overhaul, it didn't have that stupendous animation. It didn't add on to what the manga's bare bones choreography was. It was much shorter than I anticipated in the anime version, but it will always stand out in my mind as one of my favorite fights in My Hero Academia, and I cannot say the same for Deku versus Overhaul. And here's why. What is the spirit of a hero? What is this show really trying to teach you about what a hero is all about? A hero is what Mirio was in that point. A hero is not the ridiculously overpowered dude that's fighting villains. One of the most key themes of the entire series is that Deku got his one for all quirk because he ran up to the slime monster where he was gonna get eaten. It's because of that spirit. It's not because you're strong. You have someone like Endeavor. The series is painting him over and over again and again that even though he is a character that saved thousands of lives and he's really powerful and he's beaten more villains than even All Might, he can't be painted as a hero until his redemption, whatever, Endeavor's my second favorite character in the entire series because of how important he is to the core themes of the show itself. But if you look at Mirio, he's amplifying every little aspect of what it takes to be a hero. Can you imagine someone like Mirio who lived his whole life inferior to everyone around him with a quirk that was so impossible to use and navigate through, he could never do anything until he mastered it. Through his hard work and his tears and his dream of saving one million people, he managed to master his quirk for selfless reasons and with a big smile on his face, this man is an absolute beast. He took on the entire 1A class. He was the candidate that All Might was supposed to give one for all two. He was Night Eye's protege and he's my favorite character in the entire story. Why is he my favorite character? In part, it's because he didn't get a happy ending in the overhaul arc. Now, I'm sure that we'll end up with a happy ending as far as Mirio's character goes. I'm sure that Eri will find a way to reverse reversing his quirk and everything will go back to normal. But as it is right now, at the end of that arc, the absolute Chad Mirio phantom menaced the crap out of so many of Overhaul's lackeys and he was gonna beat Overhaul. He didn't need any Eri buffs. He was just gonna do it himself. And then someone takes a bullet and fires it towards Eri. Now this is a hero. This is someone who just sacrificed his absolute entire life. His whole life was working on honing this quirk to its absolute best so he could save a million people. Now, he gets this really tough emotional and moral dilemma. If he doesn't jump in front of Eri, Eri will die, and he will remain with his quirk to continue trying to save people, but he will then forever be living his life as the person that didn't save that poor little girl that he was able to save, which goes against every fiber of his being, and he jumped in front of a bullet. A bullet that's far more terrifying than just piercing someone's flesh. A bullet that stripped him from his quirk, which thereby stripped him of his dreams. Stripped him from his purpose. That is the bullet that killed Lamillion. That scene is so powerful for me. It's a scene that should have and deserved to be fitted for a protagonist of a series. Mirio is one of my favorite characters in all of anime, and he was given such a powerful scene right here. That is exhibiting the true emotions of a hero. Deku versus Overhaul did not. Deku just punched him really hard, and he got 
got his buffs and it was emotional as well and i'm not trying to take anything away from that fight but it was completely overshadowed by the display of heroism by mirio in that given moment and in an arc that's trying to convey that no deku was the person that deserved one for all all it really did was convey that no mirio really was the one that deserved it and what sealed the deal after the entire arc was over after deku looks at mirio and feels terrible about himself that this man just lost his title of hero and lost his very being and he's crying in front of mirio mirio is smiling at him mirio asks him why is he crying mirio doesn't regret a single step he's taken in his path of a hero he didn't save a million people but he did his absolute best he saved eri that little girl that would have been killed if not for him that is a hero smiling after losing everything that made him who he was is what made mirio one of the greatest anime characters of all time he's completely out of deku's league as far as a main character figure should be and i'm only honestly scratching the surface as to why i really love mirio so maybe i'll make an entire video on him at one point but if i don't you'll still have this part hell yeah deku versus overhaul was an empty shell of the fight overhaul had with mirio and that leads me into another extremely important two points as far as deku's character goes deku versus the villains in every coming of age shonen esque story one of the most important components is the fights now i know a lot of people may view that as superficial as far as the story goes but the fact of the matter is they're wrong and it's really important okay now as a pretty straightforward example to this is let's look at a blade how can you tell if a blade is sharp by looking at the blade well i guess you could guess what parameters the blade's sharpness has to a point but you'll be able to figure it out way easier if you actually slice something and that's really what a fight is it's a clash of ideals that could bring out far more of a reason for you to understand who the main character is than for the main character to just stroll around in the streets spouting heroic cod's wallop Ah uh, yes, I also want to save a million people, I say from my butthole, strolling down the street. But it's really when it comes to the test that you really know how the individual feels, how fake they are, and on the contrary, how real they actually mean what they mean. Now, in order for this to actually exist, there needs to be this clash of ideals to promote what we're talking about here. And I have to say, Deku sucks at that too. <laughs> I'm really digging myself a grave with this video, and I don't even care. <laughs> and I I feel like this point can be stressed again way better when contrasting it to other characters remember that knife example i gave yeah that applies to this too i'm gonna be going through them relatively quickly for the sake of proving my point this is not an entire video comparing the fights in one show to the fights of another because the fights in my hero academia are great again from a societal level and from an emotional level to some degree but not from a character level developing the character in this case deku looking at something like one piece there was this massive of marine ford war where all the world powers kind of got together into this huge squabble and a lot of people died which kind of sucks for those lot of people now if you look at the major powers in this war and the major antagonists because antagonists are awesome they were essentially the marines banding behind akainu and the pirates banding behind blackbeard now obviously there was whitebeard too and they are also pirates but i'm saying as far as antagonists go because whitebeard was more on the protagonist side of things looking at the antagonists there was, for the sake of simplicity, Akainu and Blackbeard in this one given arc. Now, in order to understand Luffy's ideals, we have to contrast them with these two characters. Akainu is a character who believes in justice. He believes in justice to such a high and ridiculous degree, he is the incarnation of authoritarianism. He is someone that believes everything should be under his massive fist. He believes in a dictatorship, essentially, where the world government decides what justice is and everything follows it's a prison it is a massive prison where people cannot live their dreams people cannot follow their hearts and people are forced to live under the cruel authoritarian justice of the molten fist akainu now i am stressing this more than it is because i can phrase what akainu is doing in a much better light he doesn't want pirates going around pillaging villages and raping women and whatever other hobbies pirates have it's a world with a lot of toil and a lot of strife so maintaining this really 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 
Italy. Powerful authoritarianist government. I feel like that's the only way in order to maintain peace, right? That's a kind of authoritarianism incarnate. And let's clash with Blackbeard also for a moment because Blackbeard is the entire opposite. Blackbeard believes in the essential human right of freedom. People should follow their dreams. People should adventure following their hearts. People should have the right to do what they want to do, not to live in some cage bound by a higher power. He believes in absolute freedom, not authoritarianism. But once there's absolute freedom, once anyone could do whatever they want, all of a sudden, bad people can do what they want, and bad people very often want bad things. That's right. Essentially, Blackbeard's mindset is the mindset of anarchy. He wants to throw the world into anarchy, a world where it's survival of the fittest, where the strong oppress the weak because they're following their dreams. Now, being that Luffy's clashing with each of them, you get to really get an idea of who Luffy is. Luffy agrees in the fundamental idea that people need to be free and not in a cage, kind of like Blackbeard, but at the same time, you can't have bad people gallivanting around doing whatever they want, oppressing people. That They have to be caged, kind of like Akainu. Luffy's finding that middle of the road. Luffy's really paving his own path in this massive world, where he's taking the best of anarchy and the best of authoritarianism and creating his whole new ideal of freedom that he's trying to give to the rest of this universe that he inhabits. That's what makes Luffy amazing. It's because we get to see how he clashes with these other characters. Deku does not have something like that. He has this abstract idea of justice and smiling and being a pillar of hope. But even comparing that to other characters, it doesn't ring as powerfully. And I don't even need to go that far. It's not just that it doesn't ring as powerfully. It doesn't stand out in the show he's in at all. Why is he the protagonist? The protagonist is someone that we should look up to above the other characters, at least to some degree. It should be his story of how he grows from Lilliput to absolute mad lad. I don't want to watch the average character in the show go from a, a slightly less average character to a slightly more average character. That's not a tale that I want to witness. But you see again and again that there are so many characters in this show that have the same ideals he has. He has no ideals that stand out from all might. There is nothing that makes his idealistic approach to the universe any different than his masters. Miri was able to exhibit it to a higher level being that he had this great contrast being that he had this adversity thrown at him in regards to taking that bullet from Eri. But Deku honestly, he doesn't exhibit any more of that heroic ideal than someone like Kirishima from his own class. But again, I'll throw some other characters at you to try to get that point across a little better. Let's look at Naruto. Alright, so honestly, Naruto's climax in the show I said it before and I'll say it again, it was Naruto versus Pain and that fight was everything you could want in a massive final battle for a protagonist. He went from a character that was hated and exiled essentially from his entire village. Everyone hated him and excommunicated him from their everyday lives. And then he became someone after this fight that the entire village started to look up to and respect. Immediately, that's the life journey of Naruto. He wanted to be accepted and respected and that's what happened to him after the pain fight. So huge props on that one. That was never an issue of Deku's. So it's not like we can mirror this with a character like Deku. In fact, Deku doesn't have any of of those long-standing goals. He doesn't want to be regarded as the number one hero. He's trying to throw selflessness at you from every corner of his asshole. He just wants to be a hero to save people. He doesn't have that past trauma that Naruto had to overcome by being accepted. Any past trauma he would have to overcome is, I guess, getting bullied by Bakugo. But in that case, he never seemed to hold a grudge about Bakugo anyway. You know why? Oh, because he's such a perfect character. He's so nice and wholesome. He didn't even get upset that Bakugo bullied him for years. Well, I mean, that's really nice and great as far as an amazing human being goes, but I'm not watching a show to watch an amazing human being. I can't relate to someone who's just a perfectly awesome human being that doesn't bear a grudge against anyone for anything. Naruto was pissed off at Sasuke for the majority of the series, and you know what? That strengthened his character. If it would have been Deku in those shoes, Sasuke would have been a bitch to him. He wouldn't have gotten jealous. Sasuke would have been overpowered. He wouldn't have gotten jealous. He wouldn't have gotten mad. Nothing would have phased the guy because he's a perfect angel. But back to Naruto versus Pain for a half a second. That was the ultimate clash of ideals. They were both trained by the same master. And because of this, they both had the same end result in mind of creating a peaceful world. Naruto wanted to view it through an eye of idealism and Pain was trying to regard it through an eye of cynicism. He didn't believe something like that could actually happen, so he tried to take matters into his own hands and scare the world into submission. Naruto, on the other hand, believed in the hearts of people. He said that people are fundamentally good, unlike Nagato, who viewed people as fundamentally evil. I love this contrast so much because it's such a powerful philosophical debate as well. And because of this essential difference in both of their minds, they were able to craft an entire 
different path to their ideal future. And Naruto won that clash of ideals at the very end, even more than winning the physical fight. When he went up against Nagato at the very end, and Nagato was completely drained of his power, Nagato said, you are the chosen student of Jiraiya, and I submit to you. I give up. Your ideals won. Not your fists, your ideals. That's what makes a fight truly great, because it's not just on the physical level of who could punch harder, but it's so, so much more that goes into a truly great fight between a protagonist and an antagonist, and this fight really did it. Would I have ever noticed that there were two major themes in the show? Are human beings fundamentally good or fundamentally evil? Not at all, but it's because of this Naruto versus Pain fight, where Pain said the only way to find peace is for me to oppress people in order for them to be too scared to do anything, because otherwise the fundamentally evil core of human beings will rear its ugly head, and Naruto said no. That's an amazing clash. That's an amazing battle. And I'll even do something a little more recent for you. I understand you want to say Naruto versus Pain is a massive climax of a grand saga, so you don't want to include it, and mad respect to you. Fine, fair enough. We didn't get to see Deku versus Shigaraki yet, although I don't want to get into Shigaraki right now, and while I do love him as a character, I don't love him as a massive antagonistic force in the series, as basically the embodiment of chaos. To let you know in a nutshell, so I'm not just farting out baseless opinions, I love Shigaraki as a character, I see his backstory, I see what he became, and I love all of that. And I love that the entire My Hero Academia story is essentially taking the good and bad of society and clashing them against each other. That's something I love about the show. And that's something I really like about Shigaraki, as he is the embodiment of the chaos of society. He's a broken member that was produced by the society that they inhabited, and that makes him a good character. But as far as an antagonistic force, it's not like there's any ideals behind his actions to clash against the ideals of the main characters. Something that we're really trying to say that Deku embodies is this good ideal and good heart and wide smile that people can be rest assured that he exists. But that isn't a contrast to someone like Shigaraki. Shigaraki's an amazing villain because he takes the form of the ugly part of society. That's not a contrast with Deku's ideals. So as far as a character goes, love him. As far as a component to My Hero Academia society, love him. As far as an antagonistic force, which remember, the most important aspect to an antagonist very often is to show us the true nature of the protagonist. That is not present. And that's not a flaw in Shigaraki per se, as much as it's a flaw in Deku. As the protagonist, he has to be shaped by his antagonist, and he's not. But as far as a more recent anime, so I don't need to talk about the Marine Ford War, which is like 500 episodes in a series, or Naruto versus Pain, which is like 500 episodes in a series. Demon Slayer, Kimetsu no Yaiba, an anime that aired last year that was, in my personal opinion, overhyped. I liked it, but not as much as many other people seem to. In fact, I prefer My Hero Academia to Demon Slayer. So we'll just kind of put that out there, let you guys do what you want with that information. But uh, I'm not here to suck off My Hero Academia. In fact, I'm here to um, destroy Deku. <laughs> Welcome to the world of Demon Slayer, a world with humans and demons. Demons are regarded as rather unapologetic individuals that, well, they, they try to kill because they try to kill humans, so we try to kill demons. Kind of makes sense. I get all of that. So in this world, neither the demons nor the humans can actually understand the other side of the coin. The humans hate demons with a passion, and the demons view humans as a food source and hate the demon slayers with a passion because, well, they're trying to kill them, so I kind of get it. So being that that's the actual backbone of the demon slayer verse, welcome, Tanjiro. Well, Welcome the protagonist, a character that does not live that generic ideal of kill demons. He tries to kill these demons because they're eating humans, but he tries to understand them. He tries to kill them in the most painless way possible. He tries to feel their emotions and feel bad for them. He tries to live their ambitions and ideals out as well. He feels terrible for what they have become. He hates that he has to kill demons, but he has to kill demons. He tries to appease every single demon he kills as they die. He does his absolute best in that regard, and he has a compassion towards these demons that no one else had. And it's not just because he's a moral Jesus that was born upon the world, like Deku. Everyone praised Deku for his absolute superior morality. Let's praise this kid forever. No, that was really not where he was coming from at all. I would argue that's the opposite of where he was coming from. He was also someone who always hated demons. It's only when his sister became a demon, and he loved his sister and tried his hardest to keep his sister safe, that he realized, wait a second, demons aren't inherently evil. Nezuko isn't trying to eat him at every given point in time, and that's when he really begins 
begins to grow emotions towards these demons. That's when he begins to actually feel bad for them. They're all tragic human beings that were turned into these creatures by even more vile creatures. It's because of the situation he's in and all his character growth put together that made him who he is. Now, Tanjiro is not my favorite character in Demon Slayer. He's not my favorite shonen protagonist of all time, but it's because he's clashing with these demons and showing them this compassion at the very end of their lives that you can really see who he is. He really gets honed as a character because of the battles he fights. It's something that lets him stand out from every other demon slayer on the planet and really give you, the viewer, a much, much deeper glance into what's really going on in the psyche of these humans and demons and how everyone is viewing it slightly screwed up, whether on one side or the other. And speaking of Deku versus villains, and this is gonna be a short point, but it's extremely important, Deku always wins. Every single anime has a story about a main character growing up and it never happens that the main character always wins his fight, right? And it's not even with strategies. He wins because he remembers his friends. He's like, holy crap, I have to be this awesome smiling hero, dude. I'll punch with 4 million percent of my actual strength and voila, the bad guy is defeated. He never loses to a villain in the story. I'm choosing my words carefully because he technically lost to Todoroki, even though it didn't really make sense that he did. And he technically lost to Bakugo, even though it didn't really make sense that he did. But whenever it actually mattered, he did not lose. He didn't lose a single vital fight in the entire story. Not that he was stronger than every opponent. No, he was weaker. And the story helped tell us he has a long way to go. But with the power of friendship, you heard right, Deku is a bigger abuser of this power than freaking fairy tale. Deku beats muscular and he beats overhaul. And oh, don't say that. There was actually, in fact, damage he took from those fights. Lasting damage. He had to learn uh, an entirely new set of techniques using his feet. Mind blown character growth right there. Man, when I think of amazing power-ups from protagonists, nothing hits me harder than learning to kick. So that brings us back to Deku, a guy who doesn't manage to hone his ideals or his character through his fights. I feel like every single one of his fights is absolutely lackluster on a physical level, on a technical level, and on a character development level. As I've mentioned, it manages to pull the emotional highs out of you, and that it does. And I like that aspect of My Hero Academia a lot. Deku versus Bakugo, both of them were really good, but it's not like it actually developed Deku's character in my eyes. It's not like it actually made me understand something about Deku that I never realized before. It does doesn't make me like Deku at all. In fact, I don't like Deku. I think that the best fight in My Hero Academia is Deku versus Todoroki for this reason. That's a fight that actually cemented Deku's character. Obviously, him sacrificing his success in the tournament to save Todoroki isn't nearly on the same level as Mirio sacrificing himself to take that bullet for Eri, but at least it's in the same wavelength. That's why when someone asks me if I like Deku, I say I like Deku until season two, and then after that point, I kinda don't like him. Post-tournament arc, Deku had zero development. Deku had zero growth in his ideas. All Deku had was the voice in the back of his head second-guessing himself for the entirety of the My Hero Academia narrative. Am I really deserving of one for all? Probably not. I don't know what to do. I'll bite my nails for 20 minutes. I'll mumble myself. Amazing strategies to use against villains that never actually work because the fight always ends up in one punch anyway. I don't really know about this, guys. And he always finds reassurance from other people. He never actually has the wherewithal to find that in himself. And when he does defeat a villain and he's like, you know what? I am deserving. Okay, you beat a villain. Wonderful. If someone else would have gotten one for all, maybe. Maybe he would have been more deserving. The idea of the character that Deku became is something that infuriates me, and therefore I decided to make this video. And this video has released so much of my pent-up stress because not only am I able to get my thoughts on the matter out, but I'm able to piss off an entire fandom, which is one of my favorite things to do on the internet. I love doing that. It's basically my hobby at this point. And I don't want to make an entire section of this video dispelling future criticisms of my arguments because honestly, I don't care. These are my arguments, and that's why these are my thoughts for Deku. This this isn't a video why you should hate Deku, it's a video why I do. And also, if you're smart, you would hate him too. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to say that. But I already know people are gonna say, no, if you look at Deku, he has grown, he doesn't cry as much. That is such a weak mindset. That is the most superficial aspect of his character. Oh, he was a coward and now he's less of a coward. Wow, look at this character development right here. Holy moly. But it doesn't create an image of who Deku is, it's just, oh, now he's a less cowardly hero. Hurrah! Every single arc 
Mark has Deku giving himself an inner monologue of, I'm stronger now. I'm a better hero now. I won't cry anymore. And honestly, those monologues are kind of boring. It's like Deku telling the reader, hey reader, you watching me? That's right. I had something called character development. Read it and weep, bitch. And he's done that many times throughout the story. I could keep going on, but I feel like I really painted a really good picture on why Deku sucks. Deku's a terrible protagonist, and I feel like almost every other shonen protagonist from mainstream shonen is actually better. I'm not gonna mention every single one. I mean, I feel like I don't need to say why uh, Gon is actually a much better character than Deku, because if you don't think that way, then you either haven't seen Hunter x Hunter, or you have four brain cells that you're rubbing together to try and produce some electricity. Or it's just personal taste. Personal taste is completely justified. If you like Deku, power to you, I'm happy. You get to enjoy a show. Huge flex. I, on the other hand, am gonna be doing the bigger flex. I'm gonna be a masochist while reading the comments of this video because I am looking forward to them. I am spitting straight facts, love it or hate it. And I'm doing the best of all these things. Annoying the crap out of an entire fandom. So, if you also like to laugh at toxicity, do me a favor. Yeet this video to your friends. Give this boy a share. Send this to like My Hero Academia fans especially. Or people that like hating on My Hero Academia. That works too. But anyway, while I talked a lot in this video about what I like about My Hero Academia, I'm hopeful that you enjoyed this earnest take on why Deku's trash. And I could have made it longer, but honestly, I didn't have patience to talk about Deku for that long. Like, I have so many paragraphs in my script that I cut out because I just don't want to talk about him more. I don't like this character. And I'm not afraid to say that like some other people seem to be afraid of dissing popular shows. I like memeing a lot. Memeing is wonderful. And while I do consider this video a massive flex on the My Hero Academia, academia community that doesn't say a bad word toward this lovely angel and i am memeing to some degree in regard to how far i took this rant <laughs> a lot of you've been asking me for anime analysis and well i think most of you had in mind how i would analyze why some characters are awesome so i took this chance to analyze why other characters are awesome <laughs> and why deku sucks so i made everyone happy hurrah huzzah definitely subscribe to lord nuxenor for future thought-provoking memeing trolling and roasting content I do everything here as long as I kind of want to do it and I kind of want it to throw Deku. So, hell yeah. Hope you were able to feel the passion in this video because the passion was there. Absolutely. Smash like to counter the uh, inadvertently aggravated army of dislikes that this video will probably have. And all in all, I think this was a fun time. Kind of feel a little bit bad though that as far as the really, really long anime analyses that I've made over my time, I made like an hour long video on Fairy Tale. I made like a 45 minute video on Saitama, one of my favorite protagonists of all time and here we go as far as the kings of nux taku's anime analyses as far as length goes a video on deku kind of sad hate to see it but also love to see it <laughs> Oh my god, what's wrong with me? Why do I enjoy this thing? Why am I such a masochist sometimes? And a sadist at the same time. Huge flag. Warning you in advance, the Zoro video that I promised all that time ago will probably be longer, and I will make it when Zoro has a huge flex in the manga. That's the rules! Oh boy. Y'all not ready for no one understands Zoro. It's crazy. It's like no one understands him or something. I never script my outros, so they're always a bit rambly, but I just wanted to tell you that I love and appreciate the fact that I think I have the only fandom online that I can absolutely roast something and get praised by roasting it even by the people that actually like it. I mean, PewDiePie, the absolute mad lad himself, his most disliked video on his entire channel is a video where he said he didn't like Marvel, okay? <laughs> and this guy said the n-word and he's done everything. And here I am, a channel that talks about anime relatively frequently, and here I am crapping on the most popular anime's most popular character. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm so proud of this community. I love all of you. This is awesome. Don't be afraid to be who you are, fam. It's way more fun that way. Have yourselves the most wonderful evening. And remember to stay weird, fam. <laughs>